All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our training today, um, our what we call COVID Zoom training, right? Um, today, we're going to talk about the process of you've listed a house, now what? That's what this, so this class is about, you have the listing contract, and as an agent, what are those next steps that you should be taking to, uh, to get that property on the market properly? How do we take that property and leverage it for your business to ex help to expand your business, right? How do we take that and, and help put it under contract? But so what are sort of those next steps? So we're really going to cover between you have the listing contract, you're walking out the door with the listing contract, and we're going to cover that time frame before, between that and you have an offer contract, okay? Because then there's another class called offer to close. <laughs> so I'm going to take you between that hole between the listing contract and the offer contract. Sound good? Okay, so let's talk about some of the logistics and feel free, this isn't a huge group. So feel free if you have questions to stop me. Um, I've been on Zooms all day, so I'm talking a little fast as normal. So don't hesitate to tell me to slow down or repeat something if you need me to do that. Uh, and I, you know, we'll interact and talk about some of the other things that you have out there, other challenges that you have with it. So let's start, first off, once you have that listing, your first steps are really to get that ready to go to market, right? So that can entail everything from photography. Uh, highly recommended, everything should be professional photography. There's very few exceptions to that out there right now. Uh, you know, you need to make sure that you're presented well on the internet. It's shocking how many listings are out there. I was just on the phone with an agent looking at something that, you know, he's got an opportunity for a great property that's been on 180 days. And you should see the list, the photos out there are terrible. They were obviously taken with a phone the kitchen one is blurry. I mean, they're awful. No wonder this property has not gone under contract. It's always been important, but in COVID, the photography in your online presentation is everything because people are going to shop that listing online first and they are not even going to call or they're not even going to step foot in that house unless you've gotten their attention. So you've got to look at that property through that lens. Now, if you back that up a step, is there anything that needs to be done to put that property in a better light? Okay, so is there anything, Nate, I did not even recognize you with all that facial hair, dude. I just, I had to scroll over there. I'm like, who is that with all that hair? Wow, you are in true COVID mode, dude. <laughs> Sorry. And I have glasses on. I'm just a completely I, you different really person threw me, You threw me for a loop because when I just saw the name, I went, wait, what? Total different <laughs> look. You got a totally different look going on. Um, sorry, I digressed. Um, okay, so back up before the photos, okay, what, is there anything in that property that I need to do or we can do, the seller can do to help put it in a better light, right? So you wanna look at that property through the lens of a camera eyes or through the photography side of that and make sure you're addressing that. Now, what are some of my options? You know, we've got, um, we've got stagers, but you know, we often talk about staging can be very expensive. So you wanna be careful not to be promising full-blown staging, especially at your expense, because you can be talking thousands of dollars. But there are people out there that can, well, well, they'll come in and do a consult. So they'll take a look at what people have for, uh, for furniture and help them arrange and help them open up spaces. As an agent, most of you, if you haven't developed that eye, you start to develop that eye of, you know, clean up, clear off, open up space as much as you can. Because when you photograph that, things are going to really come through. Sometimes if you have a question, some of the things I like to do in the past when I would go out to a listing is take a photo with your, with your iPhone, not to be used for marketing, but just to kind of look at, okay, how does that present? How does that look? Are there weird things? Is there too much stuff going on? Is there stuff maybe the seller can remove so that I can get a better photo of that room, okay? Minim minimalization is always good. Cleaning up is always good. Eliminating too much color is always good because that's too much going on sometimes. Uh, so anything that can be done around that arena is is great. Professional photography is a must, really, uh, unless it's a rental or a different situation or it's a speed situation where we need to do something quickly and then we're going to do the photographs. Uh, Carrie Howell out of the Newton office does a phenomenal job. I know a lot of you have used her in the past. She's got a great eye. She does the Matterport, which is the 3D walking tour and the professional photography and a floor pan package that's really worth the money. It's not a lot of money and she does a great job with it. So all that marketing material that you need to pull together, if you can get someone like her in, they can give you that full package that you can then help. You, you can leverage to sell the property, but as a listing agent, there's another piece that you really, I want you to be thinking about and keeping in your mind 
because it's not just how do I sell this property and get this under contract for my seller, but how do I leverage this listing to grow my business? Every one of those listings is really an opportunity for you to get leverage and, and actually expand your own business and start to build your network. So we always want to be circling back to that when we get those listings on, have I fully leveraged this listing to expand my business? Don't just put a sign in the yard and, and get a check and run because then you haven't leveraged and you haven't grown from that, okay? So back to photography, if, if for some reason you need to do uh, quick photos for coming soon, or you're just going to do some basic ones, or it's just a rental, um, just to tip to let you know, most people carry, we'll tell you this stuff too, but the phone should always be sideways, not vertical. Okay, because what happens when you take the photos this way and put them on MLS, they're getting cut off on the sides. So always turn the camera the long way to take the photos so that you get a full shot when you upload it into MLS. And by all means, please don't go back and forth. <laughs> That is the most annoying thing when you look at a listing is someone goes back and forth. So you get some that are cut and then some that are full, full fledged. Okay. Matterport, floor plans, you know, videos, all the options for you to get extra leverage out there. Uh, if you haven't seen a Matterport or you need an example, if you can reach out to Carrie Howell, she'll actually give you a, a flyer that you can use in your listing presentations to show sort of what, what that is and how that's a big advantage. COVID, Matterport's been huge because it's really a 3D walking tour. A person can walk through the house, they can hit the spots, they can turn around, they can look at things. They really don't even need to go in the house. We're selling houses without people going in them because of those 3D Matterport, Matterport tours. They will, however, show everything in the property. They're very finite. So if it's a really uh, dumpy, dirty listing, 3D Matterport can be tough. It can look really tough. It can look tougher than it needs to look. So keep that in mind. Okay. You want to get the marketing materials together as quickly as possible because you want to make sure you can one, leverage those on social media, but also get your materials done so that you're ready to put the property out for market. Okay. Uh, the other piece is that once you get that contract, make sure that you're putting in that sign request as quickly as possible with the admin so that the sign can be arranged. So that again, even if it's gonna be a coming soon rider put on it, you get as much exposure and leverage out of that listing as absolutely possible. On average, they don't always take this, but on average, you wanna leave three days for that sign to go up. And she need, uh, the admins need information like what's the full address, what's the best place on the property to put the sign, and is it a regular or a luxury? And she'll ask you some features of the house to make sure that they put it up at the right house. So make sure you take note of like the color and any, you know, if it's a tough house to find because it's behind another house, make sure you're relaying that guys. I mean, I, I more than not have to go out. I've had to fill holes because signs were put in the wrong house and put sand and or put dirt and grass seed down. I don't really want to do that as part of my day. So as much information as you can give us as possible so we don't aggravate the neighbors and put up signs in the wrong yards is greatly appreciated. Now, as part of the listing presentation, you should have been sort of marking out your marketing plan with folks in terms of what are we going to do for open houses? What are we going to do for broker open tours? All of that piece. Um, you do So you do want to make sure that you've got all your marketing materials quick available as quickly as possible, right? Booking photographer, sort of setting up your timeline so that you know you can successfully roll this out. Now, it's not a hard, fast rule but rule of thumb now in this market is you see most new listings hitting the market like tuesday wednesday so that they're ready for open houses by the weekend keep in mind that when you post a listing to mls it's going to take like up to 24 hours for that to fully syndicate everywhere you don't want to be throwing stuff out on a saturday for open houses on the weekend because it's not going to be out there for people to see okay so new listings going on like Tuesday, Wednesday, typical, if you can work that out so that it syndicates out, it has time to get out there. Um, with COVID, uh, and again, stuff is getting tight again, so you may want to consider setting up listing appointments, one-on-one -on -one appointments, whether even if you're just not going to give access till the weekend, you know, expand your open house times if you can, so it's not short windows where everybody's trying to cram in, because we don't want that to happen with these houses right now. We want people to have space and safety when they're viewing and you want to make sure that we set that up. So we'll talk a little bit about the COVID plan in a minute, but 
Uh, map out your timing, map out your plan, right? What are all the things that I need to get in place? Now, once you have photos, um, once you have your, your stuff back from the photographer, the Matterports, the, the floor plans, that's when you can reach out to the admin so that you can get your brochures done, okay? Uh, and you'll want to share those photos. You can, if you've got a tight schedule, please do me a favor, reach out to the admin, give them a heads up that it's coming and the information that you do have so that they can still set up the framework and everything for you so it's ready to drop the pictures in and go for you, okay? Uh, we've got the good paper, we've got the luxury stuff, so just make sure you indicate whether it's a luxury listing or a regular, and if there's anything specific you want in that brochure, let them know and they'll generate a nice four to eight page brochure for you, depending on the property, that you can bring and leave at the property. Now, one of the new things we're doing with COVID, and we've been talking about this a little bit in some of the meetings, is uh, generating, taking that brochure, putting it digital, and then putting up a QR code at the open house to so people can scan the brochure that way if they want to scan the brochure. Now, another leverage tip for you here while we're talking to QR codes when you're doing an open house, this is also a captive audience and it's not, it's not as easy as it used to be to sort of talk to people and get some leverage and take advantage of leveraging that open house. So I would recommend taking your link to your real scout. We just talked about this in a couple of things earlier this week, right? You've got a registration page for your real scout. Um, which Alyssa is going to have to remind me because now I'm drawing a blank. Is it, is it, um, I actually on, just did it and I put uh, it on the back of my go. phone. It's on, on it's, on it's re slash onboarding. Yeah. So real scout slash, no, it's slash your name, or dot. isn't it your name dot real scout dot com slash onboarding Sla back, uh, slash onboarding and that'll take them right to the landing page so take that web address put it into the free qr code generator well this is printed it out and put it on the back of her phone you guys should have that with you all the time you can hold it up and tell people here scan it and you can get up to date stuff on all the listings that are out there now you've got those people captured that is an amazing lead capture system for you but you can also at the open houses have, have the admins make up a nice flyer for you to put in a clear thing that says looking for more information or la or up to minute, you know, information on new listings, scan here and have them register. And so now you've captured their information, you know what they're looking at, you have a better opportunity to convert those people into clients. Okay, little added bonus tip. So that was your name dot realscout.com backslash onboarding. And that'll take you right to the link, the right to the registration page. All right, so let's back up into marketing. So we're getting getting our brochures done, we're getting um, our pictures done. Now we want to make sure that we pre-market, if you will, this property as much as possible and get as much leverage out of this as we can. So what does that look like? That looks like social media, right? That, that should be stuff going out to your social media page, whether that's a coming soon, whether that's call me for first, you know, access to great opportunity. This is a hot, this is a very hot market, guys, and people are very sensitive to there's not a lot of inventory. And so they're very plugged in and they're watching that stuff online. That's huge leverage for you to sort of get them engaged and reaching out to you. Word of caution, anything you put out on social media, don't give them all the information. Don't give them all the information. Don't give them the address, the, the price, everything, because then they have no reason to contact you, right? So give them a taste of the property, the locate, maybe, you know, in the town it's in or whatever, but, and then put in a, you know, link here for more information or DM me for more information so that you have that opportunity to have that conversation with them and start to build that relationship with them. These new listings that you have coming up are also a great opportunity. We had Denise Nelly come and do Facebook ads for, uh, for real estate lead generation, new listings coming on are a great real estate lead generation piece that you can do through Google ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads. If you want to try to drive some traffic to you for minimal money invested, that's a great way, again, to just drive more traffic to you. And there's so many people online right now. Okay. What else can we do to leverage that listing? Well, get it out to the offices, right? 
get it out to the office in that in the area or your office to make sure again open that up to as many people as possible so that you can try to drive that interest in that traffic as quickly as possible so nicole uh biana tatum they can all help you with a brochure or a flyer that would go to the office telling you that something's coming soon or that something's just been listed and that's a great way to give people a heads up so you can work with someone within the office and make it easier Ola, can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you have to have a business, a Facebook business page to post, you know, um, listings and things like that? Like, do you recommend that or can you do it on your personal page? So you can post listings on your personal page. It's rec you do have to have a business page to do the ads. And it is recommended that you do build a business page. Now, while you're doing this, obviously you're gonna try to drive some of your personal traffic to that page. So that the best thing to do, Alyssa, is set up the Facebook business page post it there and then share it to your regular page so that they're linking through and you can start to drive that traffic through your business page. You can do that with the ads, with the content as well? The ad content needs to be on the business page. You can't put a Facebook the, ad to a personal. But then you can share it to your personal. Correct. Okay. Uh, the ads, well, you're not really sharing the ads. The ads are going out based on your criteria. Right and now, oh no, I meant like the content, like the like the um, the wrist media, like that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, you same thing. You can share that from your from your business page to your personal. Um, there's always that word of caution of balance your personal page, right? Don't just flood it with all business because then people will start to shut you down. So you find that nice balance where you're just starting to drive more traffic through. And it's always helpful to do some kind of. Uh, I just saw a, a, a great thing out there. Actually, I love when I see new ideas because I'm, you know, plugged in with realtors all over the country. And I, this girl did a, uh, and this is great for those of you that are trying to build some traction. There's an online uh, raffle tool. So what she did was she said, like my business page or comment on this for a chance to win a $25 gift card. And I'll go live on this day and I'm going to do the drawing. And she had a thing on the computer where she put everybody's name in that entered. And it spun the dial and it randomly stopped and she announced online that like she was giving away a gift card. I thought that's brilliant because people were intrigued. They were having fun. Somebody won a little gift card. To me, that's cheap marketing, right? And in the meantime, now she got all these people's information of, and she got traction on her page by it, right? So another way to link in. Nate, did you have something to add there too? Yeah, I did. I was going to say um, reverse search the MLS. Yeah. Excellent. For people who are, uh, or for people who are looking for properties uh, such as the one you list. Yeah, that's actually an excellent idea. So reverse search on MLS. Once you put that listing in, there's a way to go in, and, and it actually will tell you who matches up with the criteria on there. And so you can do a message back out to those agents and say, you know, op watch for this open house, or you know, let your clients know we're going to do open houses, or easy to show. Contact me to set up an appointment. Again, that just drives that added interest. That comes at it from the agent side, right? So that's just getting that added exposure to the listing. What else can you do from the agent side? Well, you can do blasts out to different offices too. You know, sometimes people will generate a list for a, a town for a property or a town. They'll go out and just get a couple of the email addresses off of MLS for some of the agents that they know have activity or a lot going on in that market and they'll blast out that flyer to those agents just again, get that added traction, right? Just to make sure we ensure we drive as many people as possible. With the online syndication, just so you guys know, uh, we're less we are less reliant on an agent telling their client about the property, right? Than we've ever been. Like we, we're not, we don't need an agent to tell the client about the property because the client's gonna find it. Sometimes way before the agent's gonna find it. So you need to focus on those online platforms and the place where the clients are, because you also want to grab that opportunity if somebody is unrepresented, that you are able to then help them and be their buyer's agent, whether it's for this property or for another one that they might want to go into. Okay. Again, this is all about, this is a double-ended component. I really, and I want to really make sure that if nothing else, you come out of this session really thinking about things this way, that... I have two purposes when I'm doing this. I have to market the property and work for my seller, which is critical, obviously, but I also have to leverage my business as part of this. And I have this unique opportunity to take advantage of that. And in this market, the stuff is going so fast. If you don't work that well, you really miss out on that opportunity. You really will miss out on that opportunity of really expanding. 
So any questions on what we've gone through so far? Or additions or thoughts? Yeah, Nick? Uh, I was just curious on the QR code thing. Uh, I understand the idea of, you know, having it uh, run a link to your real scout or yep. it, it, how do you specifically generate QR codes or, you know, if you have a link, is that a pretty easy process? Yeah. So um, I'll tell you, I'm the least techie person. And all I did was Google generating a free QR code. Yep. And you, I, I got a, I found a program and it, you put that link in and it generates the code and then you just take a picture of it to print it. Cool. Yeah. So, it's, so it was so easy. Right, you just need to know where you where your landing page is. You need to have the link, right? That. You need to have yeah. you, you need to know exactly where you want to send them. Okay, very cool. <laughs> yep, yeah, perfect. Good question. All right, so let's talk about open house act and access to the property as part of this. Um, and again, you know, with some specifics here about the COVID. If your listing's in a town where there's broker tours set up, whether they're virtual or however they're being set up, you wanna make sure you know about them and that you're plugged into that process. Um, most of the towns around here have gone to virtual and the agents are getting notifications on that and they're going through the broker tours that way. Um, so you wanna make sure that you know what that process is and you uh, put it out there appropriately so you can generate as much traffic as possible. Open houses, when can we schedule open houses for? What's the correct answer to that question? Anybody want to take a stab? Go ahead. Anytime you want to. Huh? Is it anytime you want to? We have a winner. Anytime you want to. There is no rules around open houses right now, especially with COVID. People are very high percentage are working from home. A very high percentage aren't commuting, so they have more flexibility. We get traction with commuter open houses, especially if it's in a good location. Um, where people are moving around, or it just makes sense because you want to spread out the access a little bit, right? Uh, you can do, I wouldn't hesitate actually to do lunchtime open houses right now. If I wanted to try to book some showings and try to get some more traffic of people that are around that might not have an agent, you know, you have nothing to lose to throw something out there for a 12 to one, you know, lunch open house type of thing and see if you can get some traction off of that. Worst case scenario, you throw some appointments in there, you need to be there anyway for and then Saturdays and Sundays, the only thing I want, we, we recommend you watch this time of the year is the games. The Pats games and the Sunday football can tend to be a little difficult or can, can impact the traffic. Um, most open houses are running Saturday and Sunday if they know they're expecting a lot of traffic so that they can spread those showings out. But don't be afraid of times. Don't be afraid of the old rules of, you know, one to three or 12 to two or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility there. People have a lot of flexibility. People have a lot less activities on their calendar but you just wanna offer enough time to make sure you can manage that open house, okay? And when I talk about managing an open house, if you have a hot listing, uh, you throw it on you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, your phone starts ringing off the hook, you're already getting a ton of appointment requests, please make sure you get some backup to the open house with you so you can help manage that because you need to make sure you're keeping people safe. And if you're gonna be in the house, maybe you can have somebody work it with you that you can hire one of the agents to kind of help you out and stand outside and make sure People are keeping their distance and being respectful and, and no uh, fights are breaking out. <laughs> we have had recently police show up at open houses because neighbors have called that there was a large gathering in the front yard that were breaking the rules. So, I mean, there's stuff like that that we just have to be more cognizant of and careful of and plan for so that we don't make people feel uncomfortable or unsafe and we can take the precautions that we need to take to get that traffic through there and, and get it shown, okay? Uh, what kind of things can you do when the people are coming in that you're trying to capture? Well, the QR code is my biggest recommendation. People don't typically want to handle pens for signing in for stuff. So if you are going to try to do some kind of sign in, it should be, you know, fresh pens or new pens in plastic or something that they can then take with them so that they feel safe that, you know, if they're putting information on the paper, but the least you want to sort of limit touch stuff as much as you can. And you want to make sure that you have supplies there, wipes and stuff to make the sellers feel comfortable as well as people are going around, whether that's, we've got booties in some of the offices if people need booties or, uh, you know, if you make sure you have the sanitary wipe stuff so that if people are touching services, you're sort of following up. And at the end of the open house, just kind of doing a swipe through of those common areas. The more you can do to set the open house up so people can kind of 
easily move through without touching things. So have all lights turned on, have closets, doors open so they can look in without having to touch stuff. The more you can do that, the better. And the easier it'll make the open house flow and the easier it'll um, put everybody sort of at ease. We don't want people stressed out trying to look at the house, right? And please don't let more people in that, that should be in there because I know it gets daunting when there's a crowd on the lawn and you can divide people between floors, but you have to be in air traffic control if you're gonna do that. You know, you shouldn't have any more than, I think it's six people now within that area. So it really, honestly, one party of people should be in an area or on a floor at a time. And then, and then as they move, uh, you can let new people into the space, okay? Uh, doors and windows open if it's not ridiculously cold out also helps keep people a little bit more at ease. And obviously masks are required for everything. So making sure people adhere to that and, and having a few extra disposable masks on hand in case someone shows up, you don't have to turn them around, uh, turn them away. What other kind of things can you put out at an open house to leverage for yourself? We've just gone through a lot of other ideas. Anything else that we're missing here that you should be thinking about? Um, Paul, I had uh, the thought because you mentioned the booties. I've seen this before on a couple of different um, realtor we'll call them Instagram pages, um, where the it's a thing where you put your foot into and it wraps your shoe in plastic instead of putting on the booties. What do you think of those? Do you know anything about them, uh, pricing or anything like that? Or um, They're not cheap. I actually did price that out at one point. It was a while ago, so I don't remember off the top of my head the pricing. Um, it's like an automatic machine. You put your foot down, it puts the booty on, then they walk out. They don't... Yeah. You're not handling it at all. Yeah, um, that might be that might be better at a time like this instead of having a bunch of people touching the booties and and stuff like that. Oh, and just okay. kind, kind of provides a little bit of, I, I guess, luxury you would maybe to it. You have yeah. this nicer product that people can use instead of just throwing on the booties that everybody's used before. Well, so the booties should be disposed. The booties are disposable. They get used and thrown away. Okay. So I mean, that's you don't reuse the booties in this situation at all. Um, and I would recommend, again, weather permitting and location permitting, that you have some sort of setup station before someone goes in, like sanitize their hands, put the booties on, then they go in the house type of situation. So they're not fumbling around in the house trying to do all that, if you can, like up front. Okay? And then that way you can have people getting ready while people are, you know, sort of, and if, if it's possible, an entrance and exit out of different areas also helps too, because then you're not trying to manage people going by out and in. Like if there's a front door, back door, or front door, side door, right? That that also can make the traffic and just leave like a little trash bin so they can throw the booties away as they go out or throw away any gloves or wipes or stuff that they might have in their hand at that point if they want to do that. Okay. So you yep. gotta kind of think a little more for these open houses. You gotta be prepped. You gotta have your materials together and you gotta make sure you have really everything with you. But some good points there. Signage, uh, just to backpedal a little bit here on a couple of things. Signage, you know, we put up the sign in the panel, but you need to make sure your riders are on there and make sure you're putting riders on to sort of relay the message of the property, right? It's coming soon or open house coming. Um, we've got a lot of those panels in the offices that you can grab and add on there with your rider. So make sure you're communicating to that neighborhood and the people that are driving by what that status is, because that will generate phone calls. You will get phone calls off that sign and especially we get a lot of calls sometimes the signs up before the agent's riders on and we're trying to fumble trying to figure out where that property is coming from so you know when you you'll know when the sign's going up because when you put the request in the admin will let you know that so make sure you're getting your riders and stuff on there as quickly as possible once that happens and one other backup to the open house piece um you know we talk about open houses and one of the, I'm not going to call it old tricks, but we used to walk the neighborhood a lot of times before an open house and sort of announce that listing to the neighborhood. Um, the admins all have cards that they can print up for you if you decide you want to safely walk the neighborhood and maybe leave them for the neighbors just to let them know you have this listing, it's coming on, there'll be an open house this weekend, you know, here's my contact information in case there's any problems or, uh, you know, that, that kind of is nice, especially if you have like a new construction site, sometimes that's nice in case stuff gets out of control on that new construction site, you know, they know who to contact. Uh, it's also can be helpful to set up what we call a, a special preview open house. So prior to an open house at 12 o'clock, you might have a neighbor's only invite for 1130. <clears throat> we allow the neighbors to come in and look at the house to see if they know anybody that might wants to move in the neighborhood. Now, let me ask you a question. 
What's the point of that? Is the point of that to sell the house to the neighbor? No, what's the point of that? April? To see who else wants to sell their house. Yeah, you're, you're on, you know, uh, uh, neighbors are watching to see what you do to market the house, what kind of traffic you get, what kind of presentation you make, because they, if they're thinking of selling, you're the first person they might potentially go to. And remember, with every sign that goes up, there's another opportunity in that neighborhood within 30 days. So that's real, and, and there's usually two to three within 60 to 90 days. So that's great leverage for you when you're trying to build a listing business. That's a huge missed opportunity when you don't go to those neighbors and at least, you know, even if you go with a Berkshire Hathaway mask and you have the, uh, you know, you have a nice card printed out or you can put it in a plastic baggie or something if you wanna do something to keep it safe and just say, look, I just wanted to drop this off with my card, the neighbor's property. I just listed the neighbor's property. We're going to have open houses this weekend. I am going to host a neighbor's only special preview in case you know anybody that might want to live in the neighborhood. I'd love to have you come by. That serves two purposes for you because that gives you an opportunity to have a better conversation with that prospective seller without the busyness of a regular open house. And two, it keeps the looky-loos out of your regular open house so that you can keep the buyers flowing when the buyers show up and that doesn't become like the neighbor's not going to stand in a long line to get in a house right it, just to see your materials because they're not that motivated but if you invite them ahead of time and give them that opportunity to go through safely ahead of time they may take that and that will give you the opportunity to talk to them about how long have you lived here and you know geez have you ever considered selling or where would you go if you sold and start to build that network start to build that pipeline of those future sellers okay Leverage. Well, that's my new word today. Leverage. Not my new word, but it's my overused word today. Leverage. We need to leverage. These are listings are huge leverage, guys. Huge leverage. This is where you can really launch into being a top agent if you work it properly and thoroughly. You question. can make yourself look like the end all be all agent in town. My very first listing 20 years ago was on the main road driving into Westford. And I put that sign up. And then I was doing all kinds of activity to just let everybody know I had that listing. And I was shocked how many people said, your signs are everywhere in town. I thought signs, I have one sign up, but you drive by it five times a day, right? So we just wanna be leveraging as best as we can. Alyssa? Yeah, I was just, when you mentioned um, talking to neighbors and doing the the special preview, um, are you, you said you were handing, you know, maybe your, your card, but also something else. Are you giving them like an invitation to the special preview or just information about the listing in general? No, no we, so usually it's an invitation to the special preview. Okay. And you've got the stock in all the offices. They're just on a postcard. They print them out. They look nice out of the copiers. They're not the fancy printed ones, but it, but it looks nice and it can be branded to you. So it'll have all your stuff on it. And it usually, you know, invites them to a special neighbor only preview. Okay. And that you, I know you mentioned you can't leave something in a mailbox that doesn't come through the mail. Correct. So that would have to be either you hand it to them or you put it in the mail, correct? Tape, tape, tape it to, to the door yeah. or tape it tape to the, the door, door or put it in the okay. door. Yeah. I, I always like something like that. If it's so small, like, you know, bring tape or something with you so you don't have to leave it. You know, if you drop it in the door, they open the door, they may never see it. Um, but you can tape things to the outside of the mailbox and you can... Uh, leave it in the door if you don't get them or, you know, but don't leave it in the mailbox. That's a federal offense. Okay. So otherwise Thanks. it needs to be mailed. Nate? Um, what about, what about just doing door knockers for something like that? You can, yeah. Or, not, or the, yeah, the door knockers. Yeah, would that door be, yep. that, would that be better? That sounds better than just kind of taping something to somebody's, uh, yeah. okay. You can definitely do that. And there's, and there's stock, just for those of you that are new or may not have seen them, there's stock you buy. So you can print them in the office. Um, or the admins can help you print them right on the stock for the door knockers and then their door hangers with the cutout so you can leave it right on their door. That's a great idea. It's a great idea. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't discount neighborhood walking in COVID. I know it's a little scary and we have to be very cautious and take precautions. You know, I would, if you ring the doorbell or whatever, step back so people feel safe and have the mask, obviously. Um, but I, and I would put your branded stuff on, your name badge and stuff as much as you can. So you're not scaring people behind the mask. So they kind of know why you might be there, but you'll be surprised. People are kind of held up. So they're not, you know, they're, they're happy to have a conversation. And we've gotten a lot of listings over the years from door knocking. 
you'd be surprised how many people, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk right into somebody's house right off the street like that. If somebody says, Hey, no, I really do want to sell, come in and take a look at my house. Say, you know what? That's great. I'm, I'm running into another appointment today. So let me put you on the calendar and I'll come back so that you can go away, research it and go in fully prepared. And also you sort of making, you know, taking that extra step for your safety. Okay. All right. Any other things from that leverage side of we got open houses, We've got walking the neighborhood. Um, you can do postcard mails as well, right to the neighborhood. Um, you do remember, key point, we don't wanna miss this, online advertising. Every listing gets AdWorks for two weeks from the, on the company dollar. Every listing gets two weeks of AdWorks. And that includes rentals, guys. Those are going out there for the rentals as well. So there's two things you wanna do to make sure you take advantage of that and really leverage those two weeks because that's valuable time. That will go to a radius around your listing. You want to log in under BHHS resource into your AdWorks account. And you want to check out the ad that was generated. And you can make any changes that you want to make to the ad. Ideally, the one reason, there's two things I want you to do when you go in there. Check the ad and make sure it has like your cell phone number, not an office number or something on it so that the calls are going directly to you. And you want to make sure you put in your seller's email address into the campaign right away. Why do we do that? Because one of the biggest battles we have with sellers is what are you doing for me? How is my house getting out there? What kind of exposure have you gotten? And by putting their email address in on that AdWorks campaign, they're going to see their own listing across the internet, not just in Facebook, across the internet. That's what the AdWorks ads are. And they're powerful. They're powerful. These agents will call me and say, oh my God, my, my seller is so excited. They just saw their own listing pop up and they're like, if we see it, everybody's seeing it, right? We want them to know that it's out there and you're getting good traction. By putting in their email address, you ensure that they're gonna see it the minute they go online. So if there's multiple people in the house that own it, put multiple emails in there. You can do that so that they all see that property. Okay, you get two weeks. So if that property goes under contract fast, like let's say it goes under contract in a day or two, for some reason, it's such a hot property, go in and update that ad. Because what's going to happen is, uh, you know, you want to keep, you're going to keep the ad, you don't lose the ad because it went under contract, but update the ad so you can keep getting leverage. Like this one went fast, but call me to be on the list for the next or, you know, or call me to get plugged into upcoming stuff. So that again, you drive that traffic to you. And that's where Canva comes in helpful because you can make fun little graphic stuff, right? This hot, the little hot buttons and all that kind of stuff. Nate? Um, as far as the um, sending out mailers and note cards and stuff, obviously you want to sort of send them out into the town, people you know in the town. And um, I assume you probably would want to send those to also your sphere of influence. What about other potential leads, buyers and sellers, would you want to necessarily send that stuff to them to sort of show value or do you not want to really bombard them with, I'm doing other things and then they sort of get in their head that you're very busy? Yeah, How would so you that's, that? that's the danger piece of there. The, the, the piece with people that I know after buyers and sellers, I want to be having conversations with as much as possible and not bombard with just stuff right? Okay. As much as I can. So I'd be careful with that. If it's something that's of interest, obviously you want to put them into the loop faster. So you come from service that way. Um, mm -hmm. It's also a good opportunity to reach out to a buyer and say, Hey, I just listed this property. I know this isn't really the area you were talking about, but I just wanted to circle back and make sure nothing's changed. Like, so it's a good excuse to reach out to people and mm -hmm. have a conversation just to see, make sure that they're plugging into everything. But you don't necessarily want to just send them that type of marketing as like an agent being like, hey, this is how I market your home. This is how I can market your home for like a seller or something like that. Or well, So that's different. A prospective seller, it might be, here's, a, here's an example of some of my stuff in action, mm -hmm. right? So that's different. But usually with a seller, a lot of that stuff you're doing in a listing presentation. So you're talking about that. Um, I don't know that I'd keep, I don't know that I'd keep bombarding them with stuff. I think you, that's a case by case and evaluation because I think there's that fine line between hey he's too busy for me and 
look at what a great job he does. So we've got yeah. to, we've got to show that value without bombarding. I think is is okay. the word of caution I'd have with those types of things. On your sphere, though, you know, sending out because you just mentioned the sphere. On your sphere, if you've got your sphere in Sage, that's a great mailer to do out, right? Do out a new listing property and say, hey, just listed this great house. Know anybody that wants to move into this market? Again, especially those of you that are newer, but all of us, I've been in the business 20 years and sometimes the hardest deals I have to do with my family members because they don't know really what I'm doing out there, right? So it, it helps them see, hey, wait, you, this is, they're actually a good agent. Like I would actually want to refer people to them. You know, they're actually doing a lot of business. I mean, you laugh, but my own father, 20 years in the business and I was a top agent, my own father will call other agents to get advice. My mother's like, really? Like, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, you, you have to keep in front and you have to let them know what's going on. Okay. So it's a good, there's a good balance there. April? I have a question. Um, so the AdWorks automatically populates when you put a new listing in MLS, correct? Correct. So if you did it, if you did a listing coming soon, would it automatically do that or does it wait it'll till it's- once it goes active. Okay. I'm All pretty right. sure I can, we can confirm that, but I'm pretty sure it'll populate once it goes active. Yeah, because I would rather have it populate active, not coming right. soon. No, it'll populate when it's active. And it usually takes, just so you know, when you post to MLS, you're not going to be able to go into MLS. You know, when you post to MLS, you're not going to be able to go to AdWorks and it'll be there right away. It's mm -hmm. usually overnight, it syndicates mm -hmm. out. So usually if once you post it by the next morning, it'll be out on like your AdWorks and you'll see it out on the other sites. Okay. Some stuff is instantaneous, but uh, a lot of that stuff syndicates in batch. Okay. Okay, good question. Uh, I non MLS listings. That's another good point. Like if you have a non MLS listing, we have a contract, reach out to the admin so they can help you work with that. So that you can get, uh, I believe we can load it in manually and take care of that for you. Okay. Other questions, other pieces. So before I dive into other stuff on the digital side, anything from the house standpoint, uh, leveraging the neighborhood, We've talked about campaigns. We've talked about walking the neighborhood, right? There's a lot to do when you get a new listing, isn't there? This is sort of like a boots on the ground. It's time to hit the ground running and make sure I can communicate to this as, as many people as possible. And honestly, uh, you know, I, I, you'll hear me say this multiple times over different things, but attention to detail when you have a listing goes a long way. Goes a long way. You know, those little touches. The leaving the, you know, make sure you're leaving the house really good when you leave, making sure you have the stuff for people to wipe, making like those little things people will notice and really elevate you up to a different level. It's also very important, like when you're working that open house, you know, have your name badge on, be, you know, be professionally dressed, make it very clear that you're the realtor listing that property when you were there so people can seek you out and, and understand, uh, you know, you are the person that's getting the job done for them. Okay. All right, so one other area that I want to talk about that I think that is really important, and then we can go through if there's any question stuff. Um, I want you to really, once you post that listing, okay, and you get up that next day and you start, you go in and you're going to do your AdWorks campaign and make sure that that's all set up. I want you to then act like what the seller is going to do because they're going to also do this. So you need to be ahead of them. You need to research that property. So you need to Google that address and check your syndications. Make sure it's syndicated out properly. Make sure there aren't errors out there. We've had stuff in the past where, you know, Zillow has picked up a sale as a rental. That's not us. That's a Zillow problem and you have to contact them because this, you know, this, it gets glitched in the system. So be, act like a buyer of that property, act like a seller of that property, start to Google and make sure everything looks like it's updated out there. You know, and you want to check the big ones, the realtor.com, the Zillow, the uh, Redfin usually gets very heavy traffic. There are cases where you need to claim your listing. I think it's on realtor.com, right? And I think in Zillow, you can actually go in and when you Google, it'll come up and you'll, you'll be able to claim your listing as that as your listing. So you wanna make sure you're taking care of that so that it's properly reflecting to you and someone else doesn't go grab your listing and use it for online leverage. Nick. Uh, I had a question about that. So I actually, I had a rental listing um, that Zillow like screwed up when it went up and it didn't attribute it to me. And I actually, I sent them multiple emails and just never heard a response. Uh, so I was wondering, is that, is there actually a way to get in touch with people over there? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a 
That's a good question. It changes on a regular basis. It is hard. And I have people, we've got folks, agents will call us all the time and complain. And it's like, yep. it's totally out of our control because it's a Zillow issue. Yeah. Um, it, I, the answer to that question, the success I've seen is being relentless, you know, being annoying. I think if you Google it, if you go into the contact stuff, as opposed to emailing, you can occasionally sometimes track down a customer support phone number. And we've also gotten some traction with that sometimes. Okay. Uh, they honestly just, I mean, just, they don't care right. of their site. That's not the purpose of their site. <laughs> so it, it's hard pressed to do it, but if you're relentless with it, and at least if you get ahead of it, like, you know, you have a problem like that and you relay it to your seller. Hey, look, <clears throat> you know, we have a problem with Zillow. That's not our company issue. That's with Zillow. I'm working really hard to fix that. You've gotten ahead of it before they start to think, Hey, wait a minute. What, what did he screw up? Right. You didn't right. screw it up and you want to make sure you take that off the plate. It just kind of seemed like in a market that goes so fast, like if I have a problem with Zillow, the, 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 the likelihood that it would get fixed before the weekend, it just seems like, you know, yeah. never going to happen. <laughs> well, again, I'm not telling you it's an easy feat, but it's worth trying at least if you can, just because right. people will be out there. Um, and, you know, maybe some, sometimes we've done a small change to it and I'll update the record that way. But yeah, it, it, that one especially can be uh, barking up the wrong tree, but. But you do have to try to, you have to know what's out there, right? You have to be able to know what's out there. You want to know how that property is coming up. You want to claim it wherever you can so that you are the agent that people contact as best you can. Mm -hmm. The online world, unfortunately, is not perfect, excuse me, but. Good, 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 good. What else? So another, anything else in terms of online marketing stuff, other ideas that you guys have? that you've done in the past? I mean, you've got the Instagram, social media stuff. You've got uh, LinkedIn, you've got, you know, your networks, you've got AdWorks, you've got your database stuff, your CRM system, right? You've got Facebook ads, Google ads, LinkedIn ads. If you want to spend a little money, you know, try, don't go huge. Don't spend a ton of money on it, but do a couple of Facebook ads. Just, you know, they're, they're getting a lot of traction right now, guys, because so many people are online and that doesn't take a lot of money. That Denise Nelly that did that session, that session was recorded by the way. So if you wanted to go back through that session, but she also offered a 30 minute free consultation. So you have a listing coming up, take her up on a 30 free minute consultation and have her give you some content suggestions and stuff for things that are getting traction at that time and that point. The online world is always evolving. So you need to stay kind of plugged into what's working today. What worked pre-COVID isn't working now, right? And the stuff in COVID is a little bit different but we want to make sure that we're plugged in and we're getting, we're communicating as best we can. Paul, a quick question. What do you think about um, TikTok? I've seen like a few agents using TikTok. I don't have a TikTok, my kids do, but have you seen that a lot more? So I actually, uh, so yes, I am seeing it more and there's agents actually getting great, great traction out of it because there's not a lot of agents on TikTok yet. Right. So there's people actually using it and getting some great traction. That I watched a, uh, a panel presentation out in the West Coast that someone was talking about this. This she's actually like my age. She's a middle-aged realtor. She's become this sensation on TikTok, and they think that's so funny because she's like, I don't actually really know what TikTok is, but I'm a sensation on it. You know, that's how she talks. <laughs> so, I mean, any any venue where you're out in front of people that you can figure how to do that. What the, the key with any of the social media stuff too, though, is we want a couple of things out of it, right? Know what you want to get out of it. You want your name recognition, but you want to engage with people. You want to have something that puts them what we call a call to action, right? A call to action is we want that person to do something, to message me or call me or send me an email so that they can get something. So make sure you're trying to incorporate something like that into that so you can actually use it and get something out of it. You can have fun with it, but also get something out of it. Okay. Other than that, all I can tell you is I've only been in there once or twice and it sucks you in like crazy. So it's, <laughs> definitely a, it's definitely a, an addictive, just like all the social media, right? It's just a another I've addictive seen, platform. I've seen some stuff on TikTok of realtors showing houses, um, doing like a quick 45 second walkthrough. But my concern with TikTok is who is it going to? Right. Uh, are home buyers at, are there actually home buyers on there? Because if you look at um, the numbers of all the social media stuff, TikTok's up there. It's like top three I did, or top five as far as traffic is concerned. But who's yeah. on there traffic wise? Is it mostly kids who don't really care or 
are people actually really going on there to find information? Uh, I, I, think so. I think you'll find people on there, whether they're out there intentionally to find right, information yeah. or, they're, or they're stumbling across it. I think, you know, I think that's an interesting question, but um, I think the numbers show that the millennials are on there pretty heavily already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, just, that's, a, that's the biggest market in the yeah. real estate world right now. So, yeah. I've been watching a variety of content and I see that there are teenagers, there are moms, there are people that are showing off like workout routines. And I've been following all the realtors. And what I have seen is a lot of educational content, mm -hmm. not so much about uh, open house itself but they're showing what's needed to buy a house, what, what qualifies them for mortgage, like little bits and pieces of content like that. So yeah, that's to catch their attention. Yes. Yeah. So I, I have a whole list of people that I'm following to eventually try to put something together myself, but without stumbling on my words, but yeah, yeah that's what I'm seeing a lot. And I don't think it's only kids there, not at all. There are a lot of people out there just watching yeah. just because they're quick videos, like 15 second stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and COVID is just going to increase that, right? Cause we're going into higher numbers and people shutting down a little bit more and doing less. So the more that happens, like I always tell realtors the what the best day aspect and get on the phones and call was during a massive snowstorm in Massachusetts. Because where is everybody sitting at their computer at home? They're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. And they're perusing the computer. It's the best day to pick up the phone. It's the best day to post content because people are engaged and plugged in. So you have to think sort of, you know, on when, who do I want to reach and what's the timing of when I reach them. But I, I'm not going to say no to TikTok. I, I think that's another, you know, if you want to explore a venue, then explore it. Um, pick something though. Don't, you know, don't try to do it all. Pick something and, and get yourself some traction on it first. You don't have you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do every little platform, but pick something and become better at it and get some traction and become known and have that as part of your listing presentation that hey, by the way, my, you know, my TikTok has 20,000 people following me that are looking for new listings that are coming on messages. And you know who knows? Who knows? That could be the next thing in the next 6 months or so. So, excellent yeah. question. I can tell who has kids at home. Yeah. yeah especially, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, what else is important? So we've kind of, that's a lot of information in terms of prepping for the listing to go on, getting the materials together, leveraging the listing by getting it out to the market as much as you can, both people you know, people you don't know, right, to drive as much traffic as possible. Um, you get through that open house. So the other piece that I just want to add in here that is sort of like the next phase is, so and what about like once I, you know, do that open house, um, what if it doesn't go under contract, right? We might have offers to review or analyze, but what if I don't? What if I now I'm stuck with the property for more than a week? Um, so one of the key things I want to talk about here is communication with your seller. Communication with your seller is critical, guys. That's why I think you need to be very plugged into what's going on online with the property, and then you need to be communicating to the seller. By the way, here it is, XXX. These are all the places that it's been. Right, take some pictures of it, talk to them about that. Watch some of the analytics in terms of that traffic. AdWorks is gonna give you some of the reports on analytics. So you'll see how this is how many people I've had showing it. Does that necessarily mean <coughs> or clicking on it? Does that mean those people all were active buyers for their property? No. But what you're showing is exposure. Because if the hop if the property doesn't go under contract in that first week, what's the conversation I'm gonna probably be looking to have with that seller sooner than later? Price, right? My price is probably off. We might have known that coming into that at this point. If I've taken great pictures and I've had great exposure and I told you it should have been 20,000 less, I'm going to need to show you that I really got the leverage that I promised and that in reality, we got in front of everybody we needed to get in front of, but because of your price, we didn't drive the traffic into the house or to an offer, right? And so that's going to come by data and data needs to be relayed to those sellers. Even the most, I don't know how to describe it, but you know, even a seller who acts like they don't really care, just go do your job, I don't care, I'm not gonna use another agent, you're the person for me. Be professional, be diligent, follow up with them. Here's where we stand. This is the kind of traffic we've had. This is some of the feedback we're getting. Please don't share every negative comment about those people's houses with them. 
you know, filter that out to what really is good feedback that they need to hear. You know, people don't like things that are very personalized, but that doesn't mean that's the whole world. But sometimes the fact that the house, you know, four people say, well, that, you know, that red room didn't work for me. And, you know, maybe now we have to look at painting the red room to make it more appealable, uh, more appealing to more people and more marketable so that we can get better traction going forward. Okay, so communication is key. I personally, back in the day when I did a lot of listings, I like to set that expectation up with that seller. You know, by the way, when I take your contract, I may be very busy getting you out to market over that first week. But, you know, the minute we get to that first open house, you know, I'll talk to you before the open house, make sure everything's ready and sort of what we need to do to get ready. And then we'll talk after the open house. So I get you some feedback from the open house and I'll give you some of the stats on the online traffic and the things that we're seeing so that they know, they know you're going to be in touch with them. They should never have to call you. They shouldn't have to call you. You should be calling them. If they're calling you too much, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Then you're not staying on top of that listing. Anything that stays on more than that first week, you should com be communicating with that seller every week. You should be giving them an update every week. Look, I don't have a lot to tell you today because we're losing traction. Here's where the competition has changed. Here's what's going under contract in the market. Here's where we're not matching up to what we need to match up to. Here's some suggestions of how we can now potentially put your property in a better light. You as a listing agent, that's your job to make sure you're continually monitoring that competition, know what's going on, you know, even with your open houses right up to that last minute, you know, did something new come on the market that you need to know about? Did a new listing come on that's tight competition? Did something go on a contract that was active? So we have less competition. We wanna be very plugged into that market so we can communicate it to the sellers and the prospective buyers that might have questions around that. So good communications, good reporting, good data information uh, back to those sellers. Because again, that's part of your process. And that's going to be part of the process you relay in a listing presentation. So again, everything you do in this listing becomes leverage for your listing presentation. Can I right? ask you a question? Yeah. How much did you push um, for them, like for painting and, you know, when you first take a look and see, um, you know, with your eyes, what you think is going to stand out as a negative, yeah. like, how do you balance that? You know, like explaining what That's you think it, should yeah. be done, but then also, you know, knowing that there's cost involved. Yeah. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my opinion on this because that's really all it is from what I've seen for 20 years in the business. I've always come from the rule of thumb that uh, you've got to take into account a couple things here. If there's, so there's not one general rule of paint, you know, uh, paint the cabinets always to get better money. And I actually, when I was a very active agent in the market uh, in, out in Westford, there was another agent that thought that granite countertops were the end all be all. So she made all her sellers put granite countertops in, you know, and spend like $10,000. And sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. And when it didn't work, they were mad because now they spent $10,000, right? So there's a balance there of, you need to be looking at what is the seller's motivation right? What is the seller's timing? Like if, they, you know, if they're trying to get out because they're getting into another listing, then we don't have time to do a lot of stuff, right? So, and what is the timing of today? Like what's the timing of the market? So if I tell them to go off and do all these projects, is that potentially lining me up to a point where the market is going to have changed potentially? And I put them in a worse situation because the market's changed. Okay. So we've got to balance that. And then you've also got to look at what's that seller capable of? What's that seller really capable of? Because you'll have a lot of people who will say, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean up all this stuff. I'm going to put away uh, everything. I'm going to paint this. I'm going to do all this before I get it on. And you come back a month later and they haven't done anything, right? Usually by going into the listing and talking to people, you can get a sense of, you know, are they the kind of people, if you come in and they haven't organized and cleaned for you, you know, then there's probably a lot of obstacles in the way for them getting to the market. So you might want to help them and say, so look, a good cleaning might go a long way before we get this on and just some general organization. So let me, can I, you know, would you like a couple of options? I can plug you into a couple of people that might make it easier for you. Okay. But it is a balancing act. Uh, you're seeing in today's market, everything's perfect, right? It's highly visual, these markets now, and it's highly uh, you know, people look at that online. They want it to look brand new. They want it to be fresh and clean. Well, sometimes that's a long road to get there. <laughs> and you don't, uh, 
my my favorite saying when I was a listing agent was you don't want to put lipstick on a pig. Right. I don't I don't want to slap something on that's not really going to make a huge difference, but that's going to lose me market time. So if a project's underway or let's say they started the bathroom and they haven't finished it. Well, yeah, so maybe that's a good project to focus on for the next week because that will give us value. Right. But there are a lot of projects where you can spend money uh, and they're not going to get that money back in their eyes. It, you know, it's going to help market it, but they're not, quote unquote, going to get that money back. And so we have to evaluate that carefully. I feel but, like to I feel like when you go to the listing proposal presentation, you kind of gauge to see how they feel about it. You know, you're like, you know, if you wanted to, you could put a fresh coat of the, you know, trendy light blue, gray color paint on here and see how, what their reaction is. And if they don't want to do it and say, or not, we can just leave it how it is and, sh you know, and then move on. Yeah, that, that's where you have to play into what is their capacity, you know, and especially now with COVID, bringing workers into a house, right? There's other concerns with that too. So um, I always have followed from a school of though, if someone's really ready to sell, I want that house on sooner than later because I know what the market is today and I don't know what that market will be tomorrow. Right. So I always wanted to try if it was possible and they could pull it off and that motivation was there and it was a good time. And we're in a very good time because we know inventory is low. We always want to try to pull that in sooner than later if we can. Okay. Thank you. Good question. And, and you do have to watch your competition there too. Like, you know, in that Nita market, you are seeing a lot of people paint and, and change carpets and stuff. Right. So you got to play into the market and what the competition is showing as well. Good, good question though. And it's a, it's a lot, it's a little bit of a, there's not really a right or wrong answer there. It's kind of a balancing act. Uh, if you overwhelm someone, you know, that's the quickest way to lose a listing. If you come in and you're that agent, <coughs> some of you that have been around a long time have heard me talked about one of the early, early listings on. I got my first year where I went into, uh, it was a little old woman's house and I showed up and um, I don't know if she got my name off a sign or something. I showed up and uh, the house, Honestly, I had all I could do not to like gasp when I went in the door, but she had baskets hanging from the ceiling everywhere. Now I'm a Virgo. Anybody knows what a Virgo is? They like clean and simple and neat, right? That doesn't work for me. Baskets hanging all over the place. And not only were the baskets hanging everywhere, but they had about 40 years worth of dust on them and, you know, crap collected on them. She could barely get to the door to let me in, right? So I said to her, let me walk around the house and then we'll talk about listing your property. And I walked in and the house was old had old carpets, it had dirt everywhere. And this is a woman who can barely move. She's older, right? She doesn't have a lot of capacity. So I started by saying, you know, why are you selling? Why are you moving? I need to understand her motivation. And she was, you know, trying to get into a simpler place because she wasn't mobile. I asked her if she had family helping her with the move and she didn't really have local family, which was kind of obvious from the way she was having to live, right? So I went into the listing presentation and just said, you know, so here's the deal. Let's work with what we have. I feel like you need to get on the market. Um, you know, she started to ask, do I need to do stuff? I said, well, I'm, I'm getting a sense that that's going to be very hard to do and that you really want to be on the market sooner than later and get under contract. So I would say if we pr price it appropriately, we'll find a nice family that's not afraid of doing some work, right? And then we can work to have some folks come in here and help you get out of here. She actually burst into tears when I told her that. And she went on to share with me that two of her good friends were older, long-term realtors in town. They both came in and did the, this all has to go and this has to be cleaned and this has to be painted routine on her. And she can't do it. And so she listed with me, we sold it to a lovely family that's still living there now 20 years later. They gutted it out, they were happy. She was thrilled with the number she got. She didn't feel any worse for what happened. So it doesn't always have to look that way, right? We have to remember that we've got to meet people where they're at and we have to be the resource to help them get to that finish line. So it don't make up that it's just about numbers. Sometimes it's about what they can and can't do. Okay, Nate. Well, I have a question off of what you just said. Um, I have the potential to list a friend of mine's, uh, his father's condo in Danvers. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately they're sort of in a uh, hoarding situation. Yep. Um, so it's been years since I've been in this basement, but I know that there's issues down in the basement. And I think one of their motivations for selling, or I, I know one of their motivations for selling is lack of, lack of money, mm -hmm. lack of funds, lack of a job. So with that being said, where he doesn't, might not have the money to go and fix the basement and, and do all these sort of things, 
it's a great property. It, it just, it needs some attention in the basement and maybe in like one or two other spots. Um, how do you sit down with somebody and kind of tell them you need to put something into this property before it goes on market? Otherwise people are going to come in here and think that there's more problems than not. So, but here's what I heard you just say, Nate, they don't have the money to do that. Right. So you can't, so, you can't, you can't take that approach unless you know that like there's family that could help, or there are times when you can find a contractor. Sometimes you can work with a team member that will do the work and take money out of the closing, mm -hmm. you know, for something that is, is definitely going on the market and will definitely sell. Um, so yeah. Then these will go. Do, huh? These will, these will sell. I mean, yeah. they've got two oversized, each of them are identical. They have two oversized detached garages. They're yeah. very well built and there's just, there might be like one or two things that have to get fixed. Um, well, when you say that, like what kind of stuff are you talking about? So they were built, the family's owned it for forever. Um, and there is a sunroom in between two, the two units. So the, the, it's connected. The whole, con, the whole two buildings are connected through this common sunroom. So a wall has to go up there. Um, other, or unless somebody wants to come in and just buy the whole property and, and have extended family live there. Um, but it might be easier to sell them individually, putting up a wall there, which I can help do. But I know that there's issues in the basement and there's, other than mold remediation, there might have to be uh, some other stuff, some walls that might have to come down. Okay, so Thanks let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back you up here. So what I'm hearing you say, and, and so this is, a, this is a word of caution as an agent, okay? Because mm -hmm. it, it's hard, it's very hard to do this sometimes. There's expectations of what we think needs to be done and what really needs to be done to sell. So always start from, listen, a house can be a teardown and it can sell. There's always value there in any state, right? So I have to figure out what's reasonable. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of what you're saying. I'm hearing there's not a lot of bandwidth there to do a lot of work to get this done. So it's going to have to be priced appropriately for what it is. And then I'm going to have to try to target the buyer for what it is, right? So, you know, don't, they're not going to be the people that make this two fabulous units that have walls and divided. That's outside of their range of capacity from what I'm hearing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so look at what it is. If there's little stuff that can be done to help to try to eliminate some of that, but honestly, that sounds like an as is property to me. That sounds like an, an as is, and it's a, either a contractor or somebody that wants to, to be able to go in and build equity. You know, we're going to see guys and I, we're already starting to see this a little bit. Um, some of you haven't been around long enough to, um, to know this market, but there's a market out there, what I would have called the normal market. So the market I operated in and from, you know, the majority of my career where people are willing to come in and do work on a property. It's not too, right now our market's almost in two extremes, total fixer upper, totally new, right? And we've got nothing in between. You're seeing, because the inventory is getting so tight, you're seeing more and more of that between come back in the market. And that's going to continue to happen where there can be sort of different levels of completion or, or work that needs to be done on a property. It just has to be priced to that. Okay. If there's stuff that needs to be disclosed, then I would recommend doing a seller's disclosure. Like you mentioned potential mold remediation and stuff. I would suggest doing a seller's disclosure to protect them and to alert the buyers as much as possible. So you don't keep putting it under contract and having to do inspections and keep going back on market. So, pro so then seller's disclosure, probably see if you get a contractor in there to go over and see what it would cost to remediate or things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, how, you, that. how serious it is. Yeah, you, and you might, if nothing else, it might be just to give the quote to the buyer. Look, we've had it right. evaluated. This is what it is. This is the quote to fix it. The sellers don't have the capacity to do that. Yeah, because and, and they don't have the capacity to give a credit at closing either. So it would have to be in the pricing. Yeah, you, well, you do you do pricing, yeah. Pricing, credit at closing all, all comes down to net, what they net. It's not a question of whether they give a credit at closing or not at all, because all that is is a net price. Okay. Right, so so that doesn't mean they can't do a credit. It just means the net has to work for them. And, okay. well, it, and your job is to figure out is, can you net what they really need to get out of there? Yeah, they, I'm, they paid off they, their mortgage has been paid off for years yeah, okay. so okay. they're they're it's they're cashing out at this point so i think anything would be good for them but i just want to have the right i want to say the right things and have the right conversations yeah. with them and set set the goal appropriately for what it is i know one of the units is good i know one of the units yeah. it might have a few things in it so yeah. okay yeah so present you know again you, you've 
there's a there's a balance and the really good agents um, figure this out you got to be able to read people and like like April was saying, you know, kind of casually put some things out there like so, and it's always presented as, well, we've got a couple of options here. What makes the most sense for you guys? One, I can list it as is today. And we can be clear that, you know, there's a couple projects that need to be done. You understand that the buyers are gonna come in and have some issues with some of these things. Um, and it might be reflected a little bit in the price, but that might be the best solution for them, right? Option number two is, is there a way, and don't make assumptions about people, you know, I'll, I'll say things like, is there a way to get some of this basic work done? Was there family or is there someone that can come in and either help you with the work or help fund some of that work that you can reimburse at closing, right? So it's being that solution presenter and let them make the choice based on okay. that. Yep. But, but not putting that added pressure of them, which so many agents do, by the way. And I think it's where, you know, they fall down pretty heavily. It's, and especially in this HGTV, HGTV world, it's gotten worse because everything's perfect. And, you know, in an HGV, they come in and go, yeah, knock that wall down, go do this. Well, we, you know, any of us that have done real flips or any construction work, know it's not ever that easy. It's always a lot more work than that, right? So we don't want to put bigger projects on that seller. And we don't want to push that listing out, right? What we, we've got that balance of getting this listing sold and getting them out as quickly as possible, and really giving them what the maximum would be under any circumstance. Okay. Gotcha. Hopefully that okay. helps. Yep, that helped. Thank you. Okay. Other thoughts, questions, concerns, anything else on the sort of from that listing contract to offer stage that you'd like me to go through? Sorry, I'm antsy today. I've been sitting all day. I keep sliding off the chair because I'm moving too much. Uh, logistical question. Yep. Uh, just what what is the time frame like for getting signs put up and having brochures made? Like, is that is that something like if you get a listing on Tuesday can be done for that like that week or what's the? Yep. So the the track well process once the admin puts it in they'll be able to tell you. Um, it's when it's peak season it takes up to three days potentially for a sign. Okay. Um, we do have uh, we do have. Um, white metal frame temporary signs that are nice that can go in the ground. So if you had an opportunity and you know you don't want to wait for that sign to go up, we can use those. Those are a nice big frame and they got the panel and it still has a place for your rider. So there's okay. an alternative for that. Um, brochures and stuff from the admins are usually also fairly quick turnaround. You know, there's, there's a, again, peak season, it can be a day or so, but they usually will take, you know, they'll take and print those out pretty quickly for you. So you're not waiting for materials. Okay. No. And you were saying about t having the brochure be made digitally and then uh, where would that be hosted? Like where, I guess, I, you know, how, where do you keep the digital brochure? <laughs> so I'm going to divert to the admins because we've been working on that and I think we have the solution to that. Okay. Yeah, it'll be, it'll, I think it's going out. I, I, I'll follow up with Nicole. We were going down that path because we've been doing that for some of the listings. So. Okay. So they just kind of have a place to host it and then you send links or whatever. Good, yeah, good question, I and I don't know the technical answer to that at the moment. <laughs> it's, okay, no, we're doing it. yep, we're doing no worries. It. And keep in mind, a lot of the um, common moves brochures that we have too, like the Commonwealth brochures that we have, like um, best tips for selling for a seller, best tips for the buyers, those are all online digitally too that you can share and links and to email or people could scan or whatever you want to do. Those are all presented out there that way too. And you've got opportunities to do a lot of things through BHHS resource as well. Good. Other questions, thoughts, areas you want me to go through in that little process of taking that listing to, you know, be diligent, have a schedule, make a plan, outline everything, give yourself a checklist. Um, I think there's a checklist out in dot loop. I don't know if that's extensive enough for you. You might want to, you know, as you start to get listings, develop your own. Um, we can certainly help you start with a framework, but you know, everybody's got different things that they do unique to them. But part of what that's going to help you do as you're going through your listing is, you know, keep that data too, because that's now information for when you go into your next listing presentation, right? You know, your brochures, some of the stuff that you've seen online, that now becomes things that you can talk about on that worked well, that you've utilized well in the past, or that you, you know, that this is how you got traction for this seller. So that becomes part of your story, part of your success and traction for getting new listings. Always think leverage guys, always think leverage. You know, if you're going to, I've had agents call me and they're like, should I spend the money to get a Matterport for this listing? Because I don't know that it'll make a difference. The question I would ask you is, 
it might, will it, it, if it doesn't make a difference on this one, will it help you get the next two or three that you're going to go get because you can now show them a sample of one you did for a listing? And if that's the case, that might be money well spent. You know, sometimes back in the day, I would have an ad or something that I did, you know, and, and spent a little money on and, and, you know, that was leverage for the next year. <laughs> you know, it's not, I mean, so sometimes a little thing goes a long way. And make sure you're plugged in on the tiered marketing. So let me just, let, let's add that section in here because just to make sure everybody's aware, when you have a listing that goes a million and up, so it's a million to a million and a half is um, Ruby or Sapphire. That's the first level. Then it's a million and a half to two and a half. And then it's two and a half million and up. Now this is different than the luxury piece because luxury properties run in the top percentage of the market. This is different. And this is also like, it's not every million dollar property. It, it, there's some qualifiers around it. But if you get a contract for six months and you get a contract for a full 5% listing and those, fall, those properties fall into that tiered marketing, you know, let us know, even when you're going out to the property to do the listing presentation, let me know. And I can let you know of some of the publications and things that you're gonna get out of that listing. So you can use that as leverage to help get the listing. But for sure, if you get the listing unexpectedly, let us know as quickly as possible as well so we can plug you in on the tiered marketing program. Because there are things like Boston Magazine ads and uh, added marketing that you're going to get on top of that that the company takes care of. And so that's added leverage for you. How do you get more information about the tiered marketing program? Uh, the brochures and stuff are all in each of the offices. You can grab a folder on each one of them. And there will be, they're being rebranded at the moment, reworked by the marketing department. So they will be re-rolled out again over the next couple of weeks, but they're available to use now as they are, so, okay. Great, well, I think that was a lot of information. I know it didn't take two full two hours, but um, I'm glad you guys joined me today. Uh, any questions that you have, I'm gonna just kick 